This is a collaboration between uh, a group of uh, researchers in our group. And uh, uh, this is a kind of, uh, especially uh, Yu Ting, uh, she's uh, my summer intern, and uh, she just joined uh, our group uh, recently. And uh, I will talk about something uh, about uh, uh, pharmaceutical drug development, but uh, hopefully this talk will uh, show some interest to people in different areas. Uh, I will try to make sure this is a presentation, not uh, just a kind of application, it's more about um, uh, the method and also some deep thinking about uh, uh, deep neural net. So first I will talk about the background, uh, what is the kind of uh, drug development and uh, something called QSAR. Uh, QSAR, I will explain it. Basically that's a research area to study the relationship between a molecular structure and its chemical and biological activity. It's kind of a, a group of a, a, a word, but I will uh, visualize it later on. And uh, then this cover two major uh, research uh, topic we did in the past four years. This is the kind of first thing, a small piece in one of our publications uh, published about two years ago. This is something we did yes, uh, last year. And, uh, it's a, a kind of a, it's a kind of a under review and it will be released soon. And uh, so, as for drug development, it's a pipeline. We all know that's a pipeline. It's um, start with um, uh, early development and then uh, put it into a human called a clinical trial. And uh, um, at the very beginning, it's called a target validation. It's just like a, a human body have a lot of uh, uh, locks, and uh, uh, by open each of some locks, you can solve some uh, disease, uh, cure some diseases. And uh, target identification validation is for that. And the hit uh, generation is basically you try to find the key to solve the particular lock. The hit means a particular uh, molecules. In this case, this is a pipeline for developing small molecules. Uh, for big molecules, like a biological, they have a totally different process I will not address here. But here is mainly for small molecule. In this case, a small molecule is considered a lead. That's kind of a, a raw t form of a key. And the keys, you have to kind of uh, uh, refine it, optimize the key. Optimize key by makes it stronger and then because that's a kind of a something uh, you have to use to be safe, those kind of things. And after that, you put into animal, then put into human, finally for filing. That's a general process of the drug development. Along this process, there is a one step require a, a very, very uh, deep and strong uh, uh, medical, uh, uh, medicine and chemist capability. For this part, I mean, uh, basically refine your tea. I mean, uh, all the chemists are saying, like, it's very diff easy to kind of find a chemical to address a, a particular uh, target. But the difficult part is uh, make it the potency and also make your body accept it properly. Basically, your body can absorb it and also distribute it and then uh, sol resolve it and then finally get rid of it. Uh, and also have no toxicity be kind of to all the other part of the body. So, so all those part is called uh, uh, the chemical biological activity. And, uh, when, whenever people showing from two companies, they are showing this kind of picture. But indeed, that's only one small part of this whole thing. But uh, uh, this talk is about uh, stress this important part of this thing. Um, and uh, the, the way is like, uh, they call it QSAR. This is a kind of 30 or 50 years of area. Uh, in this area, basically kind of, uh, they study the structure, based on the structure, and then use lab, they find the activity. Based on the activity, they kind of, uh, decide which compound we should put forward to human and animal. And, uh, and this QSAR basically is not, we are not doing any lab, we just use a, a kind of a computer predict model to kind of predict, you give me a, a structure, and then I just predicted the activity. I don't really do it in any lab. And then based on that, I just rank this result. And at this moment, uh, the state of art, based on the type of work, it can reach, uh, the correlation between the lab and the computer uh, from uh, 0.3 to 0.9, which means uh, it's really, really bad in some task. It can be as good as human in some other task. So it's kind of a whole spectrum. Uh, depends on the type of work you are working on. So um, the the thing is like uh, uh, this whole thing uh, was using uh, uh, all kinds of machine learning method. Inside of Merck, we use a, a random forest uh, uh, extensive for the last uh, 10 years. But in 2012, uh, we think, uh, is there any better way? So we put a, a set of, uh, uh, like a, a group of 15 diverse uh, data set. 
and uh, with uh, some is huge, with uh, not that huge, like 50,000. It's kind of uh, uh, not that huge. Uh, it's just kind of uh, acceptable kind of size. Some is kind of small with 2,000 compounds. So we put this 15 data set uh, in the public domain the, as a Kegel competition. And then uh, the result, um, I mean, uh, deep learning uh, was used by the third, first grade winner. It's uh, George Dow. It's, he, he was a student in University of uh, Toronto. He was a student of uh, uh, Hinton. Um, and uh, then he, he, his result kind of beat uh, Random Forest, uh, our internal method. And also this was also kind of uh, uh, mentioned in one of the New York Times uh, articles. But the improvement is what? It's like uh, relatively from uh, our average, uh, Random Forest gave a 0.65 uh, correlation and uh, deep learning gave 0.7. Uh, this, uh, you consider this is a, a small improvement, but this for us is considered huge. Because for 10 years, we never see a method that beat random forces in this size. I mean, uh, we, I mean every, every, almost every day we are approached by small companies and they trying to see our method will be better. And after our testing, 99% uh, of the time it's worse than random forest. In one or two cases, they may be barely the same as random forest. But uh, deep neural net kind of uh, clearly have a, a kind of a give us a lead. This is the moment to trigger our interest in uh, deep learning area. So basically our question was like, okay, uh, deep learning is good, but it's kind of uh, revolutionary good. I mean, can we really push this uh, beyond, like reach our goal, like uh, we can abandon all the lab work, uh, finally use a computer tool for this drug development. Um, so so the basically kind of uh, one interesting thing is, um, this is a uh, winning neural net. It's, we all know it's not using those uh, kind of uh, uh, recently kind of fancier network like a convolution network uh, or the long short term memory network. At that moment, they just use this uh, fully connected uh, uh, free, uh, kind of uh, feed forward network. And, uh, and one um, kind of uh, the, the George Dahl in a later interview, he basically saying like uh, the single most important insight obtained by this uh, competition is uh, uh, he kind of uh, he is using this uh, multitask. Basically, he put all 15 kind of a set of data uh, into this one network, and uh, each output output one task. And um, uh, this is the kind of uh, in the classification problem. This is a very very general kind of uh, lay, uh, layout. But in the regression, this is a regression problem. The y is a numerical number instead of a class, and. Uh, but for regression case, uh, he has a twisted code, uh, a little bit of just code to make that work. And he thinks this is uh, the multi, but he didn't really see anything about it. And uh, we asked the inside, he didn't really see what's the inside. It's just like, uh, it's also surprising us uh, because uh, we know all the 15 data set was from a very, very different project. We never thought people will put that together to come up with one single uh, prediction model. And, uh, and some people inside of our Merck, I mean, they were really, really kind of uh, surprised because we used this uh, uh, neural net uh, in the 80s. And uh, in the 80s, or ni early 90s, we tested. And uh, of course, at that moment, it's more like this kind of network. It's even simpler than this network. It's just one layer. It's not deep layer. It's one layer. And also with smaller number of nodes. And so the key point here is uh, this get deeper, have multiple layers, and this got a multitask. So we kind of, in order to kind of address this, uh, we kind of emphasize this. Of course, uh, there are some other tech new techniques uh, involved in the modern uh, neural net. I will not address here, but I will. Are two papers about addressing this part? What are the deeper? And uh, this is one of the plot we presented in our paper in the first publication. And um, what is seen here is the uh, the x-axis is a number of nodes at each layer. <laughs> Uh, if you consider each layer the same node, the number of nodes at each layer basically is the x-axis. Y is based on the performance, how good the network perform compared with random forest. Zero means the same as random forest. And then the black line is if you have one layer, which is a traditional n shallow uh, neural net. And then uh, once you got to the two layer, it can become deep. So the message, is, the interesting message is that in the 80s, indeed we are in this domain. I mean, we they are not to go very wide in the deep layer. And then what we see is uh, the one layer, uh, generally speaking, is better. It's pretty good. And uh, so there's no need to go too deep. So that's what we see as here. But then now with the expansion of the kind of a GPU, all these kind of things, we can do a wider network. You see, once you go wider, 
the deeper net get better. So, so this is kind of one message we got out of his. So, and uh, there is theory. I mean, I will talk about that later on. Later on. Uh, NYU, uh, Anna, uh, Professor Kahn, and she gave a pretty good theory about this. Then next thing is, uh, should we go to deeper? And we go to three layer. Then once we go to three layer, this is what we get. And uh, it's, it's minimum. I mean, increase is minimum. And so the position here is uh, deep help, but with a limit. You, ne you shouldn't go to three or four. This is indeed a, a kind of aligned with the current uh, popular network. For all those uh, famous network, uh, you found that in the fully connected case, the last uh, session, the first kind of hundreds layer is for the uh, convolution net. And uh, then the last uh, few layers for the fully connected is only two or three, not uh, more than four. So that's this align with the kind of our observation here. And also, whenever you got deeper, you require wider. For example, for three, you have to go beyond like 300 nodes. You begin to meet the, and then go even higher, go a little bit higher, wider, go higher. So, so basically, this is the kind of uh, the message about the deep. And uh, so why? And the generally speaking, you, you can do the lit literature review. You see the, the good part is because um, uh, this is a very, very powerful predictor. As a classifier, it's very, very good. And uh, the theory here is in this paper. Basically, it's saying like, uh, all the, although you have a deeper network, uh, you got many local minimum, but once your network is big enough, almost all the local minimum is good. So, so basically, this part uh, showing it's a good part. And the limitation part is because um, deep neural net, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, in other application, it's good and deep because of extended direct features. And we realize uh, um, kind of, uh, of course, I mean, we checked that, I mean, it's uh, the deep uh, doesn't go good because not because of anything uh, gradient problem. It's, uh, it's really because they didn't really extract features. The reason is uh, for the neural network, uh, uh, extract the imaging feature because imaging has a lot of redundancy, but in this case, they don't really have a lot of redundancy. Um, the QSAR data, the QSAR data, almost every feature is meaningful because of the chemical structure. Whenever you change a lot of small things, uh, the whole activity can change. So, so this is a special case of all that. So the conventional method, uh, like you, we, even people try to use uh, something called uh, uh, close to con uh, convolutional uh, neural net, uh, which is uh, for feature correction purpose, uh, they failed. So I have to probably speed up. I mean, this is the second part. This is the second part for the multitask uh, problem. We, try, we answered the deep part. Deep part is, uh, yeah, deep is good, but with limitation. Uh, because of a feature, you cannot really extract, uh, have a better, right now we don't have a good way to extract feature. Then, why multitask is good? I mean, I will first explain what is here. Here we have a 15 data set, and we first uh, train each data individually, and then got uh, a bunch of results. Why it's a bunch of results? Because uh, we know deep neural net can randomize uh, the initial value. Based on the initial value randomization, you got a different performance. This box plot is showing uh, what's the range of the performance. Then you learn some all the 15 data sets together and then train a neural network and then test on this particular type result. You got another data uh, kind of box. So basically, the single network and the multi network uh, looks like this. I mean, they are comparing. And on average, uh, the multitask is better. The multi long sum everything together is better. This is something uh, I think George Dahl said uh, it's a single most import, important insight he got out of this whole thing. But it, really, there is kind of uh, no insight provided. Uh, if you look at some details, you found uh, in some data, the improvement is huge. In this case, uh, basically, there is a data set called OX2. And uh, if you just train OX2 by yourself, it's here. But if you train OX2 along with all other 15s, you got the result here. Of course, some cases can get worse. So this really, really caused a puzzle. So, so we go deeper, and we, we, we basically kind of, uh, uh, okay, this is a kind of a long sum, all 15 together. What about we do this? This is OX2. We just individually pair with all, that, all of our 14s. So basically, we kind of pair with this uh, uh, 3A4. We generally result about OX2. We pair with CB1. That's a database name, uh, data set name. We, we predict this. So what do we got here? We found that. If we pair all other 13, it's almost got the same result as a single net. But only when we pair with OX1, one, another data set, it's reached the, uh, the best result we can see here. 
This is uh, interesting. Though when we go back to the data set, we ask the scientists how they generate data set, then we realize the situation was like this. And uh, OX2 is a program. It's a program we developed in Merck, and this is the timeline they developed. And for QSR, they split the training set and tested it by time. So basically, the newer compound they synthesized, tested, was considered as a test set. Then, later on, they started a new program called OX1. It's related to OX2. And so this program have this kind of timeline. So you can see some of these compounds, uh, uh, come structure became the training set in this data set. And then we found that there are about 2,000 totally over exactly the same compound in the training set of OS1, but in the test of OS2. So, so basically, kind of, it's a kind of a multi-layer uh, uh, network. And also, we found that their activity is correlated. This, uh, although the targets are different, OS2 and OS1 are two different targets, but they are related targets. So they are their activity are correlated. So multitask uh, neural net basically kind of uh, smartly cheated. Uh, use, uh, uh, not really kind of cheated, but to use uh, this uh, data set information to help you predict uh, this data set. And uh, so we, we just ask, okay, if this is a pro I mean, if the structure is the same, but it's uh, activity is probably correlated, uh, we got a good result. What about uncorrelated? What about the negative correlated? So we just kind of uh, faked the data from here to here, make it negative correlated, and also make it uh, kind of uncorrelated. In this case, uh, we do the prediction again, this is the result. If it's positive correlated, it's really good. If it's negative correlated, it's really good. It's boosted performance from the single, uh, from a single network to multi-network level. But if it's uncorrelated, it gets get a whole thing worse. It's get a whole thing worse. So, so this is uh, basically kind of the general kind of result. We, I mean, we, our paper is kind of summary. Kind of, we have two findings. One finding is uh, uh, if uh, you have a test set, you have a primary kind of training set, or meanwhile, you have a system set. In this case, it's more like OX1. OX2 is primary, your goal. If your test set structure is close to your training set, in this case, uh, depends on their activity. It can go up and go down. If your test set is close more to your training, this primary training set instead of a system set, this activity doesn't really matter. So basically, these two findings. So based on these two findings, uh, uh, what we got here is uh, like we found uh, a system uh, training set is uh, like domain knowledge. Uh, it's kind of uh, interesting in the sense of uh, Multitask, uh, uh, we can use our domain knowledge to build uh, a, a system set, to make the activity uh, structure-wise very similar to what we want to test, and also make their activity close to what we want to test. And then, uh, so multitask DVN really kind of uh, provide a chance to incorporate uh, domain expert knowledge in this case. And this is a potential chance uh, to bring some breakthrough. So as a summary, now we see in our title, I say, is a deep neural net uh, evolutionary uh, solution or revolution one. Um, I think the criterion should be individually for each task. For each task, if the task uh, uh, is better than lab quality, it should be considered revolutionary. Right now, almost in a current form, the DNN neural net in current, we tested it, still on average worse than lab. So it's still not a revolution. It's still kind of... Uh, uh, evolution or solution. It's still considered as a one of the better classifier. It's not uh, something like uh, we'll uh, kind of uh, make the Middleton camps lost job. But uh, I do see potentials like uh, from the transfer, transferring from uh, this evolution to revolution. Uh, one is incorporate domain knowledge. So multitask even does help. I mean, pro by kind of this insightful uh, research, we found that a multitask DNN can help. But another thing is uh, craft more effective uh, uh, QSR features. This part is still kind of uh, lacking. I mean, so that's, that's for the presentation, right? We have five minutes for questions, yeah. 